got to find you guys now. We're probably on your screen at home. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, here I see you. <laughs> okay, like I said, I'm in the uh, another room. Everybody's still asleep here. So, so that's got, I'll be reading a lot in here because it looks like Rick's not on here either. And Steve's not on here. And uh, actually <clears throat> put a bunch of the uh, the commentary in here because uh, it kind of added some to the uh, the passage. So here's some warm up questions. Um, what is your favorite in the nick of time heroic action in a movie or story? Gosh, that's a good question. Nothing comes to mind right off the top of my head. I only think I think of Top Gun. Oh, yeah, in the movie. All right. Well, then this next question: When you look back over your life, what incident stands out as an example of perfect timing, the right thing at the right time? <laughs> well, I'd look that that would be probably most of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of things happen if you're if you're there at the right place at the right time. I mean, yeah. I uh, I've felt that way sometimes. Uh, when I was questioning why in the world this happened to me, it was perfect timing. Yeah, we had a. Uh, I, I think I probably told you guys the story before. My my youngest brother got married and it was up in Detroit. So they had a reception here in Indianapolis for all local friends. So it was over on like a little apartment complex around 34th street and high school road, not a great area. And, uh, hey, I used to live over there. Yeah. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> and these, uh, you know, we're having reception, a bunch of his friends, a bunch of family, my grandma, who's like 93 years old. These two guys come in with guns and rob us. Well, my brother was a all-state track guy, uh, played football in college. And so all his buddies from college are there and they're all athletes. And I'm thinking, these are the two most unlucky robbers in the world. And they they grabbed a few things and they started to leave and they got greedy and they went around and started taking the wedding rings and they, they went to my grandma and they were pulling her wedding ring off. And that was kind of a bit too far. So things started happening and um, we were able to get the gun away and one of the guys ran out the door. Well, the room is full of track stars. So uh -huh. he got he got about 20 feet outside the door and tackled and brought back in. But I was just thinking, you know, of all the places to go rob, um, one, a pretty grandma would have been able to walk out, but then went it all came down. We had what we needed to, to overtake them. And yeah, it was just one of those wow moments and crazy things happened. But yep, that's one. As a youngster, too, I think there's times when, I, you know, I've had car accidents where after I, I mean, demolished the car and and from looking at the car, you wonder how, why in the world you're alive. And so the, those are moments too that you know it's a, a perfect time and God, it isn't your time, <laughs> and 
he walk away without a scratch. Oh, I I got to tell a story. Got to, you reminded me of something, Gary. <laughs> so I was <laughs> driving my brand new Saturn, right? And it's Halloween day, and I just get on 65 at 334, and I'm headed south. And a guy is coming up behind me in the right lane because the left lane's full. This was before all the expansion, Steve. You know, we don't have all those lanes. And um, so I try to get out of his way going to the left, and he goes around me in the breakdown lane at the right and clips my rear end. And I start shooting across the median. And um, it was kind of frosty and dewy. And I thought, well, I'll get control of it as it's going across the median. And it had just slid through there like, like nothing. And then um, I look, I look ahead in the northbound lanes, there's a big Cadillac, big white Cadillac and a big uh, 18 wheeler. And I slid right between them. And there was, there was probably a hundred feet between them. Wow. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, whoo, well, that's a good, that's a good deal. I got through that. And then I hit the, the uh, berm on the other side and the car flipped over three times, three and a half times. Wow. And I end on the hood and I'm sliding through this median and it's kind of where 865 comes in. So it's that big open field triangle. And, um, I come to a stop and I'm sitting there and all kinds of things happen. Car was completely demolished and um, it hits so hard that the, the, uh, the wrench, the spare tire wrench broke loose from the tire, came through the back seat and through the windshield. Oh, and it was, yeah, it was crazy. So I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm going, why am I on the wrong side of the car? And I can't figure it out. Well, the car was upside down and I was on the right side of the car, but in my mind, I guess, was turning the car back over. And I was, so I was on the wrong side of the car. So I reached down and pull out the uh, seat belt and I fall to the ceiling, but my legs are trapped because the dash had come into the car. You know, the, the engine had pushed the firewall and the dash into the car. And I'm laying there and the truck driver pulls me out and I, he goes, are you okay? And I go, yeah, I think so. And then I just went down. I, you know, I kind of passed out from the adrenaline or something. The next thing I know, I'm laying there on my back and there's this guy laying at my head, facing me on his knees and my head is between his knees and and he goes, are you okay? I go, I look up and I see this guy. He's a high school friend of mine who was a, an EMT who had just come off shift and saw it happen. And I look up and I go, David Estes, how you doing? I hadn't seen him in 25 <laughs> years. And he <laughs> goes, Greg, I'm okay. I'm, I, I'm okay. Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> I go, I guess I'm okay. So, you know, you talk about weird things, you know, having the car go between the the, the Cadillac and the and the semi and um flipping over and having all that happen and then having the truck driver pull me out and, and then David Estes, the EMT, just happened to drive by my high school buddy. And I, that, that was yeah, that was pretty crazy. That's pretty that's a really that's a god thing, man. All those things yeah. together at the same time. So, and that you're okay, great. Yeah, yeah, I really was okay. And I'm just thinking of uh, a Psalm 91. So, the <laughs> angels watching over you, so you didn't even uh, stub your toe on a stone. So. No, I had no injuries. It was amazing. Wow. You get you take the uh, you get uh, two gold stars for your stories this morning, Greg. <laughs> well, you said you had a light group, so I thought I better. Yeah, talk. we we do. Yeah, this this is good. <laughs> so 
So how would you go about asking a big favor of a boss or other influential person? Nehemiah. Probably give him a, probably give him a backstory of what yeah. this is all about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to read this. This would be Rick, but this is kind of an introduction about the subject today. And you'll be able to read it when I send out the other copy, I'm sure. But uh, PDF. Bold and righteous leaders are needed today. Being just bold is not enough because uncontrolled boldness can violate the rights of people, dominating and trampling them underfoot. And being just righteous is not enough because without initiative and the courage to follow through with ideas and projects, nothing is accomplished. So while boldness is needed by leaders, their boldness must be controlled by righteousness. A leader must know right from wrong and know what is right and know the right thing to do. He must then act decisively and boldly and carry out the righteous act. Nehemiah was such a man. He was a true leader, a visionary who was both bold and righteous. He was a leader who exhorted and challenged others to action. Remember that Nehemiah was a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes of Persia. While in the palace at the capital of Susa, again, uh, that's where the story of Esther took place. He had received alarming news from Jerusalem. The exiles who had returned to Jerusalem were facing terrible trouble and suffering, being reproached and disgraced by people all around them. In addition, the city of Jerusalem was in shambles with its walls torn down. Hearing this news had broken Nehemiah's heart, arousing deep concern within him. For many days he had fasted and prayed about the matter. And during these days he had sought the Lord for the opportunity to bring up the subject with the king to seek his help for the distressed Jews back in Jerusalem. He personally wanted to return to help his people himself, but first he had to secure permission from the king. However, seeking a long leave of absence from the king could be dangerous. If the request displeased the king, he could imprison Nehemiah and even have him executed. Because of the seriousness of his request, Nehemiah took four months to carefully plan his strategy for approaching our taxers. How would you say that? Art. It's our desert disease. Okay. Oh, our taxer disease. Anyway, this is the suspended uh, suspenseful drama is graphically depicted in this chapter. Hey, Tony, how you doing? Wake up, Tony. I hope he did. Tony. Good morning, sir. Uh, <laughs> Good morning. I want to make sure you're awake. I, I am. I, am. I was done with the cold for two weeks, but I'm a lot better now. I'm good. Yeah. So you had a cold on while you were on vacation? No, I was home. I For two weeks, I didn't go to work. It's just flu, some strange cold. I've tried every antibiotic I could, but it wasn't going. I lost my voice, so I was. It's, it was bad. Well, glad you're doing better. So thank you. Yeah. So we're going to. Uh, this is Nehemiah and um, and our tax Xerxes, whatever. Gary had a good pronunciation there. In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Attax Xerxes, when the when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, "Why does your face look so sad when you are not uh, not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart." I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, "May the king live forever." Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? 
The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to God of heaven. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant is found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah, where my fathers were buried, so that I can rebuild it. When the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, to keep her the king's force, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates, for the citadel by the temple, and for the city wall, and for the rest that I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God is upon me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers to Calvary with him. When Sanabalat and the Horite and Tobiah, the Amorite official, heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal wall and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on towards the fourth gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through, so I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-centered re through the valley gate, re-entered. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews, or the priests, or the nobles, or officials, or any others who would be working, doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, Jerusalem's lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanabal the Hor Horonite and Tobiah the Amorite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. So any additional thoughts or comments on this? Sounds okay. like the same strife that's going on right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's there's a lot of things came to mind when I was doing this too. Uh, everything from the wall to uh, Israel and people claiming that they have no right to the land, but uh, yeah, they do. How long had it been since Nehemiah heard about the state of Jerusalem? This is the month of Nisan. From last week, it said in the month of Kilsley, uh, he heard about this. So, so how long? And next, I don't expect you to know that, but uh, other than it, I said it in the beginning. But this is uh, the month of Nissan is about our April. So uh, it's about these four months. He was he heard about it, and then it, it took him. Uh, if you recall from last the Nissan, I mean Nehemiah, I spent four months in prayer and preparation actually. What was my Nehemiah doing in verse one? In the month of Nisan, the twelfth year of king of Artist Erfes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king.
So what was he doing? <clears throat> his job. His job. Great. He was a cupbearer. Yeah. yeah. So he's tasting the wine. Just making sure it didn't have poison in it. What caused Nehemiah to be very afraid? And to answer this question, uh, you probably need to uh, think back to uh, in Susa uh, situation with Esther. Yeah, and you can get killed for breaking the cadence of the king. Yeah, and actually, the, the, I think it says I got some commentary after this section too that uh, talks about, and several of the commentators said that. You couldn't be sad in the presence of the king. You know, nothing was supposed to bring the king down. Uh, you always had to be a joyful, have a, a pleasant countenance in you when you were in the king's presence. And if you also, uh, in, in Esther, you remember that uh, you actually couldn't even talk to the king unless he showed his favor or asked you. So, uh, so he was very, very afraid. So, There's a, there's a Monty Python skit that has um, this general that's bringing terrible news to the king. He delivers it in like this song and happy dance, <laughs> but the news is is terrible. So it's playing off that yeah. concept. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to Monty Python. If you got that. Yep. Those guys were Historians, man, they were smart, smart yeah. guys. Yeah. So, what can you learn about how to deal with fear from Nehemiah? Might see. Well, four months of preparation. Yeah. Prayer. Yeah. So, yeah, and and he had all this. Uh, four months of prayer and fasting, and then even just when the king asked him that, he prayed again before he responded. So. Why do you think uh, Nehemiah used the wording underlined when addressing the king? What's that? May the king live forever. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight. Well, you know, he was placing a lot of, I, I mean, when you pray, you're praying his response will be appropriate to what you want to do, but you are placing it back on his hands that that you're saying, you're hoping that it will please the king for what you're asking to do. And that's more than saying, you know, I, I would really like to go because it would please me. I, I hope that he, it will please you. Yeah, draw more favor with honey than yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's some real good uh, practical advice the way he, he handled this uh, situation. Nehemiah did. Well, it doesn't quite relate, but a lot of times with leadership, so, so I say, well, I don't know how I'm going to ask him this and how, how, how should we approach him? Then? And they'll say, well, make him believe that, you know, it was his idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's really, it's really telling too. I mean, I thought it was, he didn't, uh, Xerxes didn't uh, kill him or banish him or get him out of the room because apparently there was a good relationship between the king and this wine taster, if you will. So, yeah, the other thing that's interesting here is that the prayer didn't take the fear from Xerxes, right? He's still afraid. But he gave was courage. It gave him courage. Yeah. What do you th what do you th what do you think the mention of the queen adds to the story? So the king with the queen sitting beside him. Asked me. 
how long will your journey take? I, mean, I don't know. Is there? Do you think there's anything implied there? Or I think it presents a setting of formality, if nothing else. It also presents the possibility of a sympathetic ear. Yeah, I mean, you don't know whether uh, the relationship of the king and queen, whether he actually, you know, may have turned to her and said, you know, what do you think? Or uh, Well, there's a pretty uh, distinct job description on what he would do for the king and the queen. And I would, you, uh, you, we were in that spot where if you were going to lose him for a period of time, the question is, who's gonna, somebody that you trust, somebody that's a handsome person, someone that's uh, uh, physically good to look at. I mean, there was all those things were part of that position. And I would think they'd be sitting saying, well, yeah, I, I can see what you're saying, why well, you need to go, but who do we have to take your place while you're gone? Who's going to yeah. sip the wine? Who's going to be loyal to us? I would, uh, to both of them. I'm sure he had a role to play with the queen, too. What specific request did Nehemiah make of the king? And what does this show about us about him? Are there any lessons we could learn? So he wanted to utilize his influence uh, for his trip, not only after he's there, but on his way there. So uh, to have a safe trip, to be able to get there and to do the job he has to do, uh, he's going to, uh, he's asking the king for his, obviously his power. But if it doesn't please him, then, you know, don't let me go. Yeah. So like you said, what can you, can you do without me for, whatever period of time, a year, whatever. Yeah. Uh, there's there's also some contrast, if you remember, when uh, Ezra set out for uh, Jerusalem. He didn't want any protection, or he didn't take any protection with him. But uh, in this case, uh, uh, Nehemiah uh, refers to having that, that protection and that uh, convoy go with him and, you know, all these letters of authorization um, to kind of uh, make sure he has safe travels. I, I think this is just a comment that we read when I read the commentary after this. Uh, what we do not understand and realize is that Nehemiah would not have known about the governors, the trans Euphrates, or about ASAP or lumber unless he had been planning and doing research during that four month period, inquiring a lot, <clears throat> inquiring, uh, there was a lot of work and research uh, before the opportunity came to speak for the king. So <clears throat> I think part of what I got from, from some of this is that, uh, again, like I said in the email, uh, work as if it all depended on you, but pray as if it all depended on God. So he wasn't just, praying to God and then just uh, hoping that God would do something. He was preparing, making himself ready uh, when that opportunity arose because he was he was able to respond to the king. He didn't uh, uh, hem on around about how, what he needed uh, to do this. And so that was probably uh, also impressive to the king that uh, he had uh, had planned and researched and he, he had some objectives and things that he was trying to do. So he, he was very specific in his request and I don't think this would have just, uh, the commentary has also commented that, you know, he wouldn't have known the, about the governors, the different governors necessarily. And he certainly, uh, because he was probably not uh, involved in the, any building projects as the, the cupbearer, but, uh, has done some research on where where can get the best timber or whatever is needed for the for the walls, and uh, so he knew about ASAP, the keeper of the king's force. So, uh, 
I think the other thing that's probably impressive to the king is that, you know, something of the magnitude of what he's asking to do, uh, that's no little task to build a wall right. around the temple. Uh, but to see uh, ne Nehemiah in his own right coming in and asking is his patience, is that even though it is of that magnitude and like saying, I need to get there as soon as possible, uh, I need to form, get, get uh, the Jewish people to help me build this. And I need to do it, need it. He just basically came with patience to get his approval before he even said anything about that. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm gonna, um, so there's several things going on in this first section uh, with, with the king. So I, I'm gonna read, and again, I know you can't probably see this. I can barely, barely see it, but. So this is some of the commentary uh, about this this section. So while serving the king, Nehemiah had, did a courageous but dangerous thing. He showed a sad, sad countenance, acted downcast and distressed, probably not intentionally, but it's probably just he couldn't uh, hide it anymore. Uh, his behavior was dangerous because the king could have become uh, suspicious of a plot uh, to assassinate him, for example. Uh, in most cases, a king was sheltered from all the sor sorrowful experiences and self suffering of human life. Uh, and actually probably didn't even hear about it. So probably the, uh, another example from a more recent example, but still a long time ago, was uh, when the, the, what's that story? I'm sure Gary would know that they they go to the queen and, and tell her that uh, the people have nothing to eat. They don't have bread to eat. And she says, well, let them eat cake. So this is just kind of another illustration of how the, the king might be uh, separated from knowing anything about the state of the people uh, that they rule over. So to appear in the presence of a monarch with any attitude other than a positive, uplifting, <clears throat> one was extremely hazardous. Thus, in the light of this, Nehemiah was risking his life by appearing unhappy and distraught before the king. However, in this particular day, the Lord had obviously prepared the way for ne Nehemiah. When the king noticed his cupbearer's distressed countenance, his thoughts did not turn suspicious. Rather, a sympathetic spirit arose for the king had asked Nehemiah why he was so sad when he was not ill. Just as Nehemiah hoped, the door was wide open for him to make his request to the king. But as scripture says, intense fear gripped Nehemiah's heart. He knew the king had stopped the building of Jerusalem years before. And see, that's something we didn't pick up with reading. The king had uh, feared a Jewish rebellion if they were allowed to rebuild the city, so it's a wall around the city, not just the temple and uh, and nation. Now, here was Nehemiah risking his life, ready to ask the king to reverse his decision, a very dangerous thing to do. Nevertheless, during Nehemiah's four months of intense prayer and planning, both of those things I thought was important, he had thought through the most wise approach he could make to the king. With his heart pounding rapidly, Nehemiah respectfully but anxiously approached the king with the common form of address, may the king live forever. He then wisely explained with his sadness with a question that would hopefully arouse compassion within the king. How could he keep uh, from being sad when the home, his home city lay in ruins and the gates burned with fire? The very city where his ancestors were buried. Note how Nehemiah showed a, a deep respect for his ancestors and a broken heart over the plight of his home city. Mentioning these two facts was intended to arouse the king's sympathy for his cupbearer, for ancestral grave sites held great meaning for Eastern culture. As hope the king's interest and concern for Nehemiah was, was stirred, and he asked how he could help. Before answering, Nehemiah offered up a, a quick prayer. He asked the Lord to give wisdom and to move the king's heart to grant his requests. 
wording this uh, petition uh, in the most humble way he could, Nehemiah acknowledged that it could be granted only by the king himself. Additionally, he requested his request should be granted only if it pleased the king and only if Nehemiah, the king's servant, had found favor in his sight. Then after acknowledging the supreme authority of the king, Nehemiah boldly made this petition, and it was and it was bold. He asked for a royal commission to travel to Judah to rebuild the house, his home city. This meant that the king would lose the services of his trusted official. No doubt, the appeal shocked the king, for the thought that he would be losing his trusted servant was bound to come across the king's mind. A suspenseful silence hung in the air for a few seconds, perhaps a minute. Then the king gave his answer. Nehemiah's petition was granted. With the queen sitting by his side, the king questioned Nehemiah about how long he would be gone and when he would return. Having planned carefully, Nehemiah knew exactly what, what he needed for the building request project. Thus, he made several additional ask, appeals to the king. It kind of goes on, but I thought this kind of gave a little bit more in-depth on what was going on and what was in the, the few verses there in the passage. So, any other comments or thoughts on the first section? It's interesting there. that there's no commentary about the queen being there. No, they, they didn't say anything other than maybe kind of yeah no they didn't they did they didn't mention it they did emphasize it in the commentary that she was there oh i think one of them did say well it obviously wasn't the um, official ball or something it's more like this was a mm -hmm. just a, a small banquet or function that there was wine being served so that's why uh the was there. So what is the purpose of going to the governors of the trans-Euphrates and giving them the king's letter, along with some of the king's army and cavalry? So he says, I went to the governors, trans-Euphrates, and gave them the king's letter. And the king also sent the army officers and cavalry with him. To preempt pushback. Yeah, and to show, yeah, this all kind of gave authority to the, the letters the presence of the, the king's uh, cavalry. Oh, without the ladders, I don't under, I really believe probably of who he was and what he was, he wouldn't hold any status at all on this on the ladder of that status by him yeah. having these letters puts him in a di whole different light with those people that would could pro possibly harm him. And that did, uh, I think one of the commentaries did indicate, although it doesn't quite tie into him going back into the cupbearer service, that uh, our track tracks disease or whatever had appointed him uh, Nehemiah governor of Jerusalem. Were mm -hmm. all the surrounding groups of people on board with rebuilding the wall? No. So, and they're they're not not Jews or some you know maybe enemies and uh, they're just uh, there was concern that you know if they're building a wall then maybe they're going to start trying to uh, defend or maybe branch out and take over other areas but they had to fortify their their city so. There's a lot of people being skeptical about uh, about what was going on and uh, what it meant for him at the uh, Israel's building a wall that he prayed to be part of uh, the European group or you know see some of those things going on today. So, oh, what might have been some of their concerns? I guess I just talked through that much. Unless anybody else has any other insights. Well, and a task of this size, it would be, I, I don't know if I should use the word easy, but he, I'm sure he was a pretty good speaker. 
And, uh, you know, you can just see the people out there going, build the wall, build the wall. And, and he says, all right, tomorrow at sunrise, we'll all meet and we'll begin. Yeah. And the next morning he gets up and he's standing there alone. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, it, the last part of this does talk about how it gets everybody involved. Yeah. Yeah. His relationship with God was so good, so close. And these other people were, you know, the Jewish people were uh, worshiping, but they didn't have the same uh, commitment or communication with God to do this wall. And they probably didn't have the motivation that he did. Yeah. No, exactly. Well, I think the, th the thing that's lost in this is the timing of it, too. It's like, it's not like it fell down yesterday and, hey, we need to go put it back up it's been down for a long time yeah 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 at least i mean since, since the jews were in captivity uh for 70 years and then i think uh through ezra and all this other people getting together and finally going over there so it's probably been down for over 100 years in the yeah, i think it was at least four generations yeah so the generations 40 years so yeah, so probably 150 160 years so what evidences of thoroughness do you find in verses 11 through 16 and uh, I think well I just, just just the fact that he had it all in place. I mean, can you imagine him getting to that point and the king saying, what do you need? And he goes, well, uh, I'm not really sure. Let me check that out. I'll get yeah. back to you. <laughs> yeah. So again, that all, all through this, uh, this story, and that's why I sent in the email to uh, just uh, work as if it all depended on you and pray as if it all depended on God. That God brings those two things together. Uh, so why did Nehemiah set out to explore, set out at night to explore the walls? Well, he wanted to see, but he didn't want to be seen seeing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there is a, a lot uh, more detail in some of the commentary about him walking around the walls, and I think it does mention something here about uh, some of the ruins and uh, of the walls, and uh, I think they uh, uh, one of them. And I, I can, I'll try maybe find it and send it out in the uh, follow up. But uh, it's a uh, where he had to get off the horse and he had to go down a different way to uh, see this one part of the wall. Uh, the uh, some archaeologists have actually found that side of the wall, the ruins, uh, down into this ravine. Uh, from that point so I always felt like uh, you, ever, you ever seen the movie um, Hunger Games yeah so there's a I, I think it's like the third one where the uh, the capital uh, attacks her district and she says I need to see it and so they they take a journey there to see it and everybody that comes along is just devastated at what they see. It's, it's, you know, there, it, there isn't like one stone on top of another. And of course the charred skulls and skeletons of, of the people that were taken are a <laughs> amongst, the, amongst the rubble. And I always thought that whoever wrote that was referencing perhaps what, Nehemiah was witnessing and and the why he had to see it. Yeah, I mean that's pro that's probably a good example because we saw this in chapter one. I mean, you heard about it, and, you know, that he was so concerned about it, and then did all this uh, planning, then he finally he just had to go see for himself. So, yeah, that's could tie into that. 
No, the patients, again, I go back to Nehemiah going in and looking at this property, looking at this land, looking at what they're going to have to do, uh, building a plan in his mind of how they're going to do it. And then I, I think of my son who is owns a, a fairly large construction company and they mainly build apartment buildings in, in Omaha. And now uh, he, they do the same thing before they ever, ever do anything to the property. Uh, now, this is in today's world, but they'll run drones all over that property looking at uh, the lay of the land and the grading, what would be needed, the infrastructure, where that's going to go. All that is planned out uh, before anything ever happens. And then architecturally, then they go to the blueprints and begin to do those. But it's a stepping stone thing, just like what Nehemiah was doing is that I know some people are saying, well, when are we going to get started? When are we going to get started? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, he was really building that plan. Yeah, I guess he could have he could have used a drone instead of <laughs> parts around there. That would have been a lot easier. Yeah, can you see that in a movie? Yeah. Here, God, please give me a drone. And God said, yeah. what's a drone? <laughs> yeah. Well, God transcends time. He actually wouldn't know. <laughs> so, uh, according to verse 12, if you can read it, where did Nehemiah get his motivation for this task? It's underlined. What my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. Yeah. Okay, so now he's he's gotten there. He's gotten uh, things he needed, made the right contact, and everything else. And, and now, as Gary was talking earlier, now all he needs to do is convince the people is that this is something we need to do, right? So, so when Nehemiah completed his plans, how did he motivate motivate the people to action? Might be underlined. Well, well, he appeals to them about, you know, this is going to make you, I, he doesn't say this exactly, but he said, you know, you're going to feel good instead of being disgraced and looked down upon and all this. And the people that were not Jewish called this wall that was all in rubble, uh, they called it rubbish. And they used to refer to it as, you know, the Jewish rubbish around the temple. So rather than being disgraced, this is a way to dig yourself out of disgrace. And be you know, and in, in God's eyes, you bring you're doing God's work. Yeah, and the, the other thing to notice too is that when he talks about uh, just look at the he didn't say look at the trouble you are in. He said look at the trouble we are in. Yeah. So he included himself in that. He identified with his brothers and sisters. So. Uh, in Jerusalem, and uh, and so that's kind of how he goes in the disgrace, and they were all aware of that disgrace. So, uh, so come, let us rebuild the wall, and uh, he then he, he gives a testimony. I mean, I'm sure it's very abbreviated here, but he also told them about the gracious hand of, of God upon me. So he, uh, I'm sure he shared with them. Uh, the vision he'd gotten from God and, and uh, his testimony about his relationship with God and how God was involved in this whole process, bringing the opportunity and opening the king's heart and all these things. So that's kind of how he motivated them. How did they respond to this challenge? And again, Gary kind of gave it a, a thing. Build the wall, build the wall. Or they, they said, let us start rebuilding. Build the wall, build the wall. Build the wall. Yeah. Yeah. And like anything that has motivation and, and adrenaline involved with it, they were probably all out. But when it came down to the sweat <laughs> and the breaking up of the rocks and rebuilding, 
uh, then you're not standing out there and build a wall, build a wall. You're saying, you know, this is not my problem. <laughs> uh, you know, Nehemiah, this is your problem. God told you to do this, not me. <laughs> yeah. So, but even as they began, send Balan to Tobiah, and oh, I got missed the letter here. Geshem came against mocking and despised them. How did Nehemiah respond to them? Because they thought he was rebelling against the king. And so. Well, you know, the, the, uh, the contractor for this thing is God. God in heaven will give us success. success. Right. So uh, he turns back and says, you know, you may think this is what my project, but it's God's project. We, his people are going to start rebuilding. Yeah. And God didn't create this as a two-state solution. So you have no share in Jerusalem or any claims or historic right to it. And I'm sorry I have that political comment. But anyway, that's <laughs> not just a two-state issue. So, yeah, that's what I said. Note the argument is just as valid today to those who challenge Israel's existence and their claims on the land of uh, Israel. So, any other comments on today's passage? Okay, going deeper, I'll read through some of this. Just got a couple questions. Uh, at times, we may not be as effective as possible because we don't do all we can to prepare ourselves for our task and potential opportunities. At times, we may not be able to be as effective as we should be because we are trying to do everything in our own strength without the balance between prayer and preparation. So I know it's a couple of questions here, but I got some things to think about too that I want to read. So what is wrong with expecting God to fix your problems apart from any effort on your part? And uh, what is wrong with trying to solve your problem apart from God? And what are the advantages of praying more as the Nehemiah did before you tackle a major problem? Some things to think about. So Nehemiah was a man with a fearless spirit and strong trust to God. He boldly went before the king because he trusted the Lord to guide and help him. And because of his trust, the Lord gave him his the spirit of strong determination. So it is with us. When we trust the Lord, he gives us a spirit of courage and stamina to carry out our tasks. Scripture teaches us two wonderful facts about boldness. One, we can boldly approach God for help in times of need. However, we can approach him only through Christ. In Hebrews it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way. We are yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. And the second is, if we will be bold in our work. God. He will not leave you or forsake you. Nehemiah was a man of exhortation, a man who challenged the others to follow the Lord and to complete their task. Likewise, as true believers in the Lord, we must exhort and challenge others to follow the Lord, to keep his commandments, to live righteous life, fulfilling their God given task. These are days of complacency. Excuse me. Days when many are, are lethargic, self-satisfied, and unconcerned. Far too many of us have been spiritually lazy, apathetic, and disinterested and passive. 
Some of us have become drowsy and sluggish, paying little attention to the word of God, prayer, and worship. We're living self-centered lives, doing what we want, when we want. We disobey God's commandments, never giving a second thought to the righteousness he demands. We're living sinful, wicked, and shameful lives, breaking one commandment after another. The fact that we must live for Christ, faithfully worshiping him, and bearing strong testimony for him seldom if ever crosses our minds. And again, this is uh, some older uh, commentary, at least 10 or 20 years old, I think. If there's ever been a day when the ministry of exhortation and challenging people to follow Christ is needed, it is today. Listen to what God's holy word says about the need for us to exhort others. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority of the universe has been given to me. Now go to my, in my authority and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to faithfully follow all that I have commanded you. And never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age. So, any other comments on the passage? Thoughts? Okay. Uh, any updates on the prayers or any new prayers? Yeah, Greg had to drop off for a PT appointment. Yeah. Uh, so any updates on any of this? Uh, everybody have a great holiday. Okay, spend a moment in prayer and then uh, we can uh, carry on about your preparations for New Year's, right? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings that you've given us, the opportunities you've given us. And uh, uh, Father, we just ask that um, as we pray for these things, pray for your blessings uh, on our family and our work, whatever we do, is that you also. Uh, help us in our, our planning and preparation for your coming blessings. We ask for your, your, your presence, your healing touch, and comfort for those those on our list. Uh, you know, we finally we just uh, boldly ask that you bring all healing uh, to them, this destroy, cast out all disease, discomfort, and pain. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Every time we ask that uh, you continue to be with us, let us feel your presence and as we approach the 2024, which looks to be and could be a year like no other. We just ask for your blessing, your protection, your guidance uh, for us, our church, and all your people. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.